had never had a conversation with my dad about the trauma that has been caused in my life because of his actions. I'm writing out everything from never hearing I'm proud of you, never hearing any of those types of things, to um, him competing with me, to um, verbally abusive, physically abusive, like all the things growing up. And this is the first time you've kind of tackled this with him. Ever. Ever. I said, I wrote you a letter, I'm gonna read it to you. And he's like, okay. And I was like, I want you to not say anything mm -hmm. during this letter. Just listen. Just listen. Afterwards, you can ask me questions, we could talk about mm -hmm. it. I don't want you to say anything. And he's like, okay. I start reading my letter. The whole time I'm reading it, pff, what? Wow. I don't remember that. Pff, when? My dad does not have the capacity mm -mm. to understand his own trauma Correct. and the trauma he has caused. Correct. I think when I released myself mm -hmm. of needing him to understand and own what he did to mm -hmm. me in my life, when that was the weight of that was gone, it was like, I can actually have a great relationship with you now. Wow. It's my and Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. Because you know she knows a thing or two. And now she's going to break down. It's a breakdown. She's going to break it down. Hi, I'm Maya Bialik, and welcome to my breakdown. This is the place where we break things down so you don't have to. It is a special day because someone's coming to visit in person, and it's not Jonathan Cohen, he's on a screen. Let's say hello to Jonathan Cohen. It's always a special day when Jonathan Cohen is on a screen. Hi, Jonathan. Oh, I like to be there in the flesh, but you know, digital version is better than no version at all. Indeed. Hello. Jonathan, you get to meet um, someone who I consider a friend. We're talking to Angela Johnson Reyes, one of my personal favorites um, as a stand-up comic, but she also wrote a book, Who Do I Think I Am? Stories of Chola Wishes and Caviar Dreams. And, you know, Angela has many, many specials. She's also an actress, but she was a professional cheerleader for the Oakland Raiders, which is just such like a fun fact about this person. But we get to learn so many things about her in this podcast. Um, why she became an Oakland Raider, hint, God's involved. And why she stopped being an Oakland Raider, hint, God's involved. We talk about God, but she's very, very um, delicate when she talks about faith because it's really more just about who she is as a person really dialed into what she needs and what she wants in, in her life. Um, she has a very, very interesting origin story, as we like to call them. Her specials are That's How We Do It, The Homecoming Show, Not Fancy, and Mahalo and Goodnight. Um, she's also been on Curb Your Enthusiasm and Superstore and um, Mom's Night Out, Alvin and the Chipmunks, The Squeakquel. And she also competed on Fox's dance competition show, The Real Dirty Dancing, which just sounds like something we all should deal with. Um, but she is currently on her sold out Who Do I Think I Am comedy tour across the U.S., encompassing over 60 cities across North America. I got to see her in person in Paso Robles. Um, she and her husband have a podcast. She has other podcasts. She's a real Really amazing person and she and I were on a USO tour together where we toured many many countries within the scope of about nine days um, on airplanes together uh, entertaining the troops and we're just gonna talk about all the things Angela Johnson Reyes is gonna walk in this door and the next thing that happens is the editor is gonna cut it together and she'll be sitting right here break it down I'm really really glad to have you here and really so nice to have you here in person um, we started this podcast, this gentleman and I, um, during COVID. Like there was, this was kind of like our solution. <laughs> Angela is not just someone who I, <laughs> there's a couple people in the world that I literally am a super fan of. And then uh -huh. I get to meet them and uh -huh. then like everything changes because um, I, that's actually, how <laughs> I'm, I'm collecting fierce, fierce, intelligent female comedians and Eliza Schlesinger I discovered after a breakup many years ago and I was like I need to laugh like I literally need to turn off my brain and just laugh and so I went on this journey of just learning who every stand-up comic was that I could access you know on the interwebs and when I found you <laughs> it was very special 
one of the things that I really love about your comedy is that it's something that I was able to and continue to share with my kids in a way that we didn't need to like have conversations about like, here's the language this person might use because you are wicked funny, you're wicked smart, but you happen to use a brand of delivery that is also really, really relatable. And especially for people who aren't ready for their kids to learn about all sorts yeah. of words and yeah. things when they are young, <laughs> they're older now. So now we're ready for you to do like yeah. a okay. super raunchy special. <laughs> um, but I ended up getting um, tickets to a show of yours and seeing you live was was uh, it's a whole other experience. I mean, as much as I loved um, watching your specials, seeing you live, seeing you work a crowd um, was so special. Thank you. Really so special. And then we had this unbelievable once in a lifetime experience. We went on a USO tour together and Unreal. it was Unreal. I can't remember all the stats. We logged like 90 hours of travel in like two days or like it was something, uh -huh. something um, really crazy. And what I learned from that tour was how much more of you there is that's spectacular that people don't even get to see. And I kind of um, for those of you who don't describe a USO tour for people who don't know. So basically, it's our entertain as entertainers, our opportunity to give back to our troops, to the service people who are out there putting not only their lives on the line, but sacrificing the time with their family and their friends and their favorite restaurants and their their bed and their grocery store that they love to go to, like sacrificing all of that to go um be on watch for us. And so we get to travel to different bases in different countries, different continents and perform for our servicemen and women. And I think one thing I did not realize before I agreed to this is that we come up with the show <laughs> totally on the plane, on the way there, we create it. And it's like, Oh wait, <laughs> is, is this a, a, like a, a project? This is like a, a full on <laughs> Uh, assignment like we're on amazing race or something like you're like okay you have seven hours to come up with a, sh a variety show right. and it's like okay what are everybody's talents here's a UFC fighter what are you gonna do <laughs> and also this was started by Bob Hope I believe and that group oh. of entertainers like in World War II because it was like let's entertain the troops and like yeah. the media was finally a big enough thing that mm -hmm. like soldiers were missing home and this was a way that like Hollywood would come yeah. to these bases and, like there's some very famous I think Marilyn Monroe, like there's Marilyn some Monroe, really yeah. famous ones. So this continues to this day. And what they do is they like put this like smorgasbord of performers yeah. together. <laughs> and um, I think just our personalities. And uh -huh. as I got to know you more, like I, I kind of, we sort of, well, I'm just a control freak. So I was super happy to just like jump in and you're just like, so, I mean, I don't want to say you're a control freak, but yeah. you're very organized. Oh, I jumped into that and leadership like, role real We found also, each other we, real quick. Right, and I was like, this, <laughs> this, this, this is my woman. And we literally, we flew to Germany was our, I believe yeah. where we landed. And at like what their equivalent of like Olive Garden in the local mall uh -huh. at the, yeah. at the Air Force Base, Wild. we were like literally knocking out what we thought a show should be. <laughs> Much of that conversation and the preceding many cities we went to was Angela being like, yeah, my own people aren't going to think that's funny, but not saying it in a way that would hurt my feelings. It was her being like, I am much more. This is what you really this is what Angela could have and should have said to me. Instead, she was much more delicate. My I'm, I'm much more in touch with the people. <laughs> I know what people want. And you are an actress, which is very important. And you're on a really popular show. But I actually interact with real humans all the time, all over the country, all over the world. They don't want anything that feels like it's from World War II. They want super fun. And Angela was basically, I mean, she was like, she was our, our MC. Like she, it yeah, was, yeah, it yeah. was an unbelievable experience. We were with the Miss America at the time uh -huh. who carried her crown in yeah. a little Thing. Mm, a very secure case. <laughs> yes, we had country singers. Yes, uh, the UFC fighter. Uh huh. Um, but I will tell Tony you, Tony Trucks. When uh, yes, another actress, mm -hmm. Tony Trucks. Uh, okay, so when I tell people about our USO tour and our show that we put together, the the things that people most respond to is what you did for the show and what Tony did. Let me tell you what what Mayim did. We printed out a scene. <laughs> from Big Bang Theory God. and we're like who's Big Bang fan out there and everybody's like yeah like they're fans 
how cool that somebody in the audience got picked to come and reenact a scene <laughs> from the show with Mayim. Like, we printed out the scenes. It, it had was a kiss so, in it, too. Yeah, it was so cool. Like, what an experience that somebody, like, here's my favorite show. I get to reenact a scene with somebody from the show, the actual show, like, it was so special. Like anytime I tell That's people awesome. that story, they're like, "No way!" It was really. It that was is so special. That's so cool. I appreciate that. But also, um, this is just going to be an hour of us flattering each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So everybody just you're you know, so pretty. Strap, <laughs> strap on your seatbelts. Um, no, but what what was what was so thrilling for me again as a fan of yours was I I might cry. Mm. Aww. Um, I got to watch you perform in so many different situations. We performed in like 128 degree weather. We like I got to watch you hold a crowd of soldiers, of Heart. kids, just kids who are like, I mean, yeah. it was some of the situations we were in were emotionally brutal. Mm -hmm. They were physically brutal. They were environmentally brutal. Mm -hmm. But what I got to watch was what it really is to be an entertainer like you are. And it means you hold that audience, you hold them up. And when they're down, you bring them up. And it was it was electric. Like it was electric in a way that being a sitcom actor never is because it's just different format. But it was just it was a fascinating experience. We I mean, we went to countries that many people I don't even know where they are on a map. Mm -hmm. Like literally mm -hmm. we went to such special places. And you also you were always impeccably dressed and put together. I mean, you do fantastic makeup. You do. You do Thanks, great makeup. Honey. You have really great earrings all the time. <laughs> and even like at four in the morning, there'd be a hoop. She'd have oh, a hoop on. Always. It's my underwear. These exactly. Are, it's like, that's Just how I get dressed. The it's hoop. Chonies. Bra. Um, <laughs> hoops. So let's though, I'd love to talk. Also, one of the experiences that I had with you was my, my first introduction into trying to own my my identity as a woman in this business because um, I'm very awkward about it and you taught me a lot about what it's like to have an assistant, like what it's like to work with someone, what it's like to be um, a person of authority without being a jerk. Um, you, you have a real presence about you and I just, I learned a lot from you and that trip, if you don't learn things from people, yeah. you are asleep because yeah. like we were together a lot in and our a, barracks in barracks awake a lot of the time it was like the strangest camp journey ever my Alex breakdown is supported by athletic greens jonathan and i love our athletic greens daily i started taking athletic greens because i was the kind of person who took a million supplements pills powders lotions and potions and it was making me crazy and also giving me heartburn. So what is Athletic Greens? Well, with one delicious scoop, you get 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, all the things. One of the reasons I love it is that it's also lifestyle friendly. Whether you're keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free, maybe you're watching your sugar, contains less than one gram of sugar. There's no GMOs, no nasty chemicals, no artificial anything, and it tastes good. Reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. One scoop in a cup of water every day, and that's it. You don't need a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Jonathan, what do the folks have to do? Visit athleticgreens.com slash breakdown. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash breakdown to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. My and Alex Breakdown is supported by BetterHelp. Jonathan, you know what I always say to you? Get help. <laughs> Yes, and when you're at your best, you do so many great things. But sometimes life gets us all bogged down. We can feel overwhelmed or burnt out or like we're not showing up in the way that we want to. Working with a therapist and getting help can get you closer to the best version of you because when you're empowered, you're more prepared to take on everything that life throws at you. Therapy's been a game changer for me. 
I couldn't live without it, so I chose not to. And now I don't plan to live without it. It's a part of my weekly practice and kind of my daily consciousness. If you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp's a great option. It's convenient, flexible, affordable. It's entirely online. Just fill out a brief questionnaire, get matched with a licensed therapist, and switch at any time for no additional charge. If you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash break today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash break. So many things that I'd like to talk to you about. Um, I I do want to mention this book because it's important to mention this book. Who Do I Think I Am? Stories of Chola Wishes and Caviar Dreams. Um, This is a really, really special, very delightful book with some very impressive people who gave quotes, Amy Schumer. This book is um, really a journey, not just into sort of understanding your comedy career, but like literally who you are, who you think you are and what you come from. So you're from San Jose, which is very special because most people don't think about San Jose a lot, except I have family there. They don't, But people are like San Francisco. That's what happens yeah. in Northern California. But you are uh-huh. from the Ho, as uh-huh. I call it. And um, I had family there my whole life. And my kids' grandparents are from there as well. Like that was that's like that's where we go we go to the hope we go to san jose um tell us what it was like growing up where you were in uh in san jose well um it's very diverse lots of different people in my neighborhood um it's it's silicon valley technology capital of the world and at the time this is before social media growing up so it was like Sun Microsystems, Cisco Systems, like all of those big tech companies, Netgear, um, all of these companies. And they were all like down the street from my house. And so like I talk about how I had, I had a lot of that influence in my life. Like we knew about all this technology stuff, but I had no desire to be in the tech world. Like I wanted to be in a gang. Like that was <laughs> how I grew up. Um But yeah, my neighborhood was a a pretty nice, mellow neighborhood. And I resented that. Like I wanted to live in the hood. Like I wanted to live like on the bad side of town and like where there would be a drive by at some point. There's going to be no drive bys on my cul-de-sac. Okay. (laughs) Um, I live on a dead end street growing up um, right next to my elementary school. So I would just walk to school every morning and I was late every morning. I live right next door. It was like my house, one more house, and then my school. And every morning I was late. But I was late because the school bell rang at 9.15. But live with Regis um, Regis and Kathy Lee Gifford started at 9 o'clock. So I would be watching Regis and Kathy at 9 o'clock when the show started until I heard the bell ring at 9.15. And then I would walk out the door like backwards because I'm still watching the TV as I'm walking out the door because I had to watch Regis and Kathy Lee in the morning. And then as soon as I heard the second bell, that means you're tardy. Yes. Now. As soon as I heard the second bell, then I would just start running, booking it to my <laughs> class. And I was late every day. What did your parents do? Uh, my mom's a hairstylist. She still is. She teaches hair at the cosmetology school. Um, and then she does her own clients on the weekends. My dad is retired now. He drove a truck, uh, a linen delivery service. Wow. And he would pick up like soiled linens from restaurants or like hotels or whatever. And um, he had his truck, his work truck. And every now and then he'd bring the truck home. And it was like our own like play area (laughs) like his truck smelled so bad because it's like soiled linen so it's disgusting it smells so bad in his truck but we loved it every time he would pull up with the truck we'd be like oh like so cool and then we'd like go explore in this disgusting bacteria filled truck um and my dad also used to take us to the dumpster sites um and we would like go dump our trash but also while we were there, you kind of got to look around and of see if there's anything cool to take home. Of course. Um, but it always it has a real specific sour smell, these dumpster sites. And I can remember it vividly. Um, but so we, we have a, a, <laughs> a real connection with sour smelling things. Um, but yeah, so my dad drove a truck uh, my whole life. And um, my dad was the first comedian that I ever met. Not professionally, but he was just the guy who got the laugh in the room in every conversation. Anytime he would let us come with him to work, 
um, at all his stops, he was the charming delivery man. He was the ladies man. All the receptionist ladies were like, oh, every time my dad would walk in and he was athletic and he would play all the sports. Like he's on a men's soccer team. He's 70. Like he still like is very athletic. Um, but that's, I grew up watching my dad be the charming life of the party, funny guy, athlete guy. And you had um, four siblings, correct? Or you have four siblings? Yeah, there's four of us, and I have an older half-brother who I met when I was a teenager. And um, you have a large extended family. Was everyone in San Jose? I'm sure people are wondering, like, when was someone from another country? Oh, yeah. So... (laughs) We uh, we have family all over the place, but mostly Bay Area, uh-huh. uh, California for sure. But I'm fourth generation. Wow! So my grandmother was born here. My mom was born here. My grandmother was born here. Um, and her mother was born in I think Utah or hmm. something. Um, my tia Mary, she just passed away hmm. recently at 102 years old. Wow! 102. Wow. She just passed away and she was born in like Delta, Utah or mm-hmm. something. So like I'm fourth generation, so I don't speak Spanish. Right. I, um, we're very in touch with Is our- Is your family Mexican from yes. Mexico? Got yeah, it. yeah. So- Because there are other places that speak Spanish. I just right, want right, to be clear because right. no, some people from would be, you know. Mexico, Michoacan, Mexico, but right. like five generations back. Wow. And like if we have family there, I don't know them. Right. You know what I mean? So it's, uh, most of my family is here. And um, while while that may be true, there also is a very, very strong component to the family you grew up in, the also the, the sense of humor you have, yeah. the sense of strength that you have. There's there's definitely a strong strain of the fact that you come from. Some people say Latin. Some people say Latinx. Sure, whatever it is. <laughs> whatever it is. Um, what was that like? Like, did you grow up knowing, like, I'm culturally a Mexican-American or was it not? I mean, I'm second generation American. So for me, like, it's very recent mm-hmm. that, you know, we were learning English. You know, oh, I wow. grew up like so it's a very different experience. But mm-hmm. but also, you know, when when we're talking about skin color and we're mm-hmm. talking about white privilege, it's a very different conversation. Sure. So I'm curious what that was like. And and San Jose is very diverse. Yeah. But I'm curious if you had that notion as as a kid. I grew up wishing I was more Mexican than I felt that I was <laughs> because I didn't speak Spanish. Like, I wish I spoke Spanish. I didn't have a quinceanera, but mm. I was like, oh, man, I wish I had a quinceanera. But, like, we weren't that like we're in touch with our culture, Mm -hmm. but we weren't like that in it. Like Mm -hmm. my mom didn't have a quinceanera. My mom was grew up very American. Like she grew up, my grandma spoke Spanish, but it was like blend in. She didn't teach none of her kids. So the older kids knew Spanish, but then they started learning like, Oh no, you need to blend in. Like we don't want you to get, you know, made fun of. And like all these things, my grandpa, um, I talked about this in my book, his, his, uh, cousin was put in the closet for speaking Spanish at school and then the teacher forgot him in the closet Ugh. and he never came home from school and his mom was like calling the school and then the teacher remembered she left him in the closet and they had to come back and get him unreal yeah traumatic yeah awful and like what that does to you and your family about speaking Spanish about your culture and embracing all of that and then it just trickles down into what you teach your children. And so then it's like, oh, blend in. Don't speak Spanish. Don't have an accent. Don't talk about this. Don't talk about that. You know, Uh, peanut butter and jelly, put your burrito away. Don't even, (laughs) you know what I mean? Um, But yeah, but I grew up wishing that I was more Mexican Mm -hmm. than I felt like I was. And Mm -hmm. there's something that I grew up having to learn. Like, no, I I just am what I am. Mm -hmm. It's there. I can't be more of it. It's just, it's there. And, you know, it's up to me, like, how much I want to embrace and am I going to actually learn Spanish one day? Right. Maybe. It hasn't happened yet. <laughs> no. Like, I, I get in my, my, my moods. I speak Spanish. Where I, of course you do. <laughs> I live in Los Angeles. Of course you do. I but also, it. you're smart. No. And you probably learned it no. in three hours. No. I, I started taking it in junior high. And then I, I made a point to use it because I was like... Mm. 
I mean, I went to I went to public school, you know, in L.A. in the Valley. Everybody spoke Spanish. Like, yeah, it was the way that you would know what the girls were saying about you before they threatened to beat you up. Because, like, <laughs> it was, you know, it was the late 80s and early 90s. It was yeah. an intense time. Um, so. You did something in your life, which is one of those things that I think a lot of women might, you know, think is not popular to wish that they had done. You're a professional cheerleader. Yeah. And it's I'm I'm fascinated by it for many reasons. And, you know, one of the reasons is um, you, you break, I think, a lot of people's stereotypes of what they might think of, or at least what many of us were raised to think of cheerleaders. Like they were so pretty and so hot, but like that's demeaning, you know? And when I see like the pictures of like you were, I mean, you were like the perfect cheerleader. Oh, thank you. Did you start cheering in like when you were younger? Tell everybody how one goes about becoming an Oakland Raiders cheerleader. Uh, so I started cheerleading Pop Warner when I was eight years old. And I was awful. I couldn't step clap. I couldn't. I had no rhythm. I could not do it. Um, I was embarrassed. I was um, afraid. I wouldn't look up. Like you know, cheerleading competition, you got to smile. Right. Look at the judges. I, nope. My head was down. I was looking at the floor. I would not smile. And I was like embarrassed and just afraid. Um so that was how I started cheerleading. Uh -huh. And you probably would be like, oh, that girl, she needs to give it right. up. Poor thing. Um, and then I just came out of my shell <laughs> all of a sudden. And now she's the star front and center. Yeah. She's in the pyramid. She's doing like all the Do things. Do you remember when, when that was or what? I mean, also the pictures of you in this book are like possibly the best part of the book. I will say, I mean, you were. Uh, my captions are my favorite. I know. The captions are hilarious. <laughs> Thank you so much. You were freaking adorable. But I'm curious. I mean, sorry, the fourth grade when you're like, yes, I have a dimple here. That's right, and everyone's going to see it. Um, but Did you see my, my Jewish caption? Yes, you dabbled in Hasidic Judaism that year because you have little payas. It's fantastic. Um, but wh when was it? Do you remember something specific of like, now I feel comfortable? I don't, but I do know I started cheerleading when I was eight, and that was the same year my parents were getting divorced. Mm -hmm. So I think I had a lot going on. Mm -hmm. But um, I think my personality naturally is like my dad is very outgoing. It's very, um, it's not, hey, everybody look at me, right. but it's when you look at me, <laughs> I'm going to give you something good to look at. You know what I mean? It's one of those. And um, I think that's where I naturally am, but I was going through a lot at the time. So I think processing that and getting through that. And then also like, as they were going through the divorce, it was like when we were on my dad's weekend, he wouldn't take us to our cheerleading mm. events. He wouldn't take us to our football games. Like he was like not participating. And so it was like, it was hard. But then after a while, also my whole family, my sister was a cheerleader. All my cousins were cheerleaders. So it was like, it, I just came out of my shell right. after, after I went through a little bit of healing, went through some therapy at school and stuff like that. Then I started coming out of my shell. So let's let's cut from that to how do you get to be a cheerleader like that for the Oakland Raiders? So I started Pop Warner. Then I did um, high school. Then I did college all-stars. And Oakland Raiders is completely different from any of this. I was doing stunts and tumbling and competitive wow. and like real athleticism. And um, Oakland Raiderettes is um, beautiful dancers that are more PR <laughs> figures. Like they're... We do public relations. We yeah. do charity events. We, You're the face of the team in yeah. many ways. So it's very different. Right. And I had a friend. This was, uh, I'm out of high school. I'm in junior college at the time. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And there was a little piece of me that wanted to be an actress. But I wouldn't say it out loud because I was embarrassed. Because it's like, how, where do you be an actress in San Jose? You don't. <laughs> like, that's embarrassing. Don't say that out loud. And then it was also kind of like, it was so far-fetched for me to be an actress, I might as well say I want to be a princess. So that was even more embarrassing. Like to have a dream was embarrassing to dream beyond what you saw in your community. That's like embarrassing to say that out loud. Yeah. Cause then it's like, Oh, who do you think you are? Like, oh, okay. It's like that kind of thing. Mm. So I kind of tucked it away in my heart and I was like, okay, I'll just, that's for those people. I'll just tuck it away. But I would like go to the movies and be upset that I wasn't in it. Cause I was like, I could do that. I know I could do that. Just somebody tell me how to do that. And um, so I was at this place where 
I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And um, I had a friend who was like a friend of a friend at the time. We weren't even close friends. It was like my cousin's friend. She moved to LA and she was in a Ross commercial. She was in an NSYNC music video. These are two really good things. And I was like, you guys, I know somebody famous. This is, <laughs> here we go. And um, I remember uh, talking to her one day and I like confided in her and was like, hey, I want to do what you're doing. And she was like, well, if you ever move to LA, I'll help you get started and I'll, I'll help show you the ropes. And I was like, really? <laughs> Oh, okay. But then it was still like, eh, yeah, right. You know, I had never lived anywhere outside of my mom's house. Right. So there was that. Then I ran into an old friend who I hadn't seen since Pop Warner cheerleading days. And um, she was like, hey, I'm a cheerleader for the Oakland Raiders. And I was like, no way. And she's like, yeah, you should come try out. And I was like, no way. That's not really my jam. Because I, I wasn't like sexy, you know, show the cleavage, shake your pom-poms. I was like competitive right. athlete and tomboy. Like that right. was me. And I was like, nah, it's not my jam. And then, this is where we're going to insert a picture of you yeah. in your uniform, yeah. <laughs> shaking your pom-poms <laughs> with your cleave, looking very sexy. Yeah. That's where it'll go. She embraced the, it. Right. Okay. But go ahead. So, um, uh, at the same time, I'm like thinking about like, what do I want to do with my life? And she's like, okay, well, like tryouts are coming up. They're like in a couple weeks or whatever. And I remember taking it to God and being like, okay, God, like if the entertainment industry is for me, then I'm going to use this as my sign. I'm going to try out for the Oakland Raiderettes. And if I make the squad, I will do it for one year and then I'm going to move to LA and I'm going to pursue my dreams. And my, my friend tells me she's going to help me. So I'm going to do it. Like, but if I don't make the squad, I'm going to use that as my sign that this was not for me. That's a lot of pressure on God. Yeah. Yeah. I put it all on God. <laughs> I was like, this is you, God. You tell me right here. This is your chance. <laughs> that seems like a God type thing to do. I mean, if you're going to take it to anyone, I would put that on God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. If you're going to take it to somebody, he <laughs> seems pretty, you know, reliable. Yeah. Competent. <laughs> <laughs> My Be Alex Breakdown is supported by Nom Nom. Your pet is a member of the family. Don't feed them like they're in the doghouse. Give them Nom Nom. Num Num delivers fresh dog food with every portion personalized to your dog's needs so you can bring out their best. Num Num's made with real whole food you can see and recognize without any additives or fillers that contribute to bloating or low energy. That's because Num Num uses the latest science and insights to make real good food for dogs. Their nutrient-packed recipes are crafted by board-certified veterinary nutritionists made fresh and shipped free to your door. Num Num's already delivered over 40 million meals to good dogs like yours, inspiring millions of of clean bowls and tail wags. Uh, my assistant Alyssa's dog, Chad, loves it so much, he literally runs to the freezer every time they open it. Chad seems more full, and Chad steals the human baby food a lot less. Num Num starts at around $2.40 a meal and comes with a money back guarantee. If your dog's tail isn't wagging within 30 days, Num Num will refund your first order. No fillers, no nonsense, just Num Num. My Alex Breakdown is supported by Pros. Many of you have probably heard me sing the praises of Pros, the world's most personalized hair care. Switching to a custom routine from Pros was one of the best things I've done for my hair, and the results kind of keep getting better. One of my huge challenges is with hair that's half curly and half straight, I never really knew how to make it not be frizzy. Uh, it took me about 45 years, but Pros has helped me figure it out. Pros handpicks clean ingredients that get you closer to your hair goals with every wash. My favorite feature is Pros' review and refine tool, which lets me tweak my formulas for any reason, like in case I change my address, my hair color, even if my diet changes, that literally can change your formula. Pros is the healthy hair regimen with your name all over it. Literally, your name comes on every bottle. It's really cool. Take your free in-depth hair consultation and get 15% off your first order today. Go to pros.com slash breakdown. That's pros dot com slash breakdown for your free in-depth hair consultation and 15% off. So I said, okay, I'm going to try out. And I drove to Oakland by myself and now I'm a tomboy girl. So I had to go to Forever 21 at the time. 
And this is like before Forever 21 was right. like worldwide. This was like the first Forever 21 is in San Jose. Did you know that? Wow, I okay. did not. So I went to Forever 21 in Eastridge Mall. And <laughs> I remember I got like a little skirt and like a cute little top and like some heels, you know, because they also sell like shoes that are made out of like fake wood and it's like you're though you got three walks in them <laughs> before they break and so I bought some little heels a little skirt and a little top and I drove to Oakland and there were 700 girls at this what? open call audition 700 girls just walking around like and I'm sure they're all amazing like all walks of life right just like some full-on in costumes some were just like super hot chicks some were just like, okay, good for you <laughs> for being here. Uh, you believe in yourself and I'm proud of you. <laughs> this is great. You know, we're all here. <laughs> Everyone's welcome. And um, uh, and, and so there's like 700 girls. On, uh, the first round, it's just so dumb. Like there's, I think they bring in 10 people at a time, maybe more than that. They put us up on stage. We all have a number. And... You just had to like answer a question. Like no. you say your name. So wait, you were not even dancing or being athletic. No, 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 no. First round is they just look at you. Oh, and listen to your voice and the words coming out of your pie hole. Yeah, because I don't know if things have changed at all. This is back in sure. No, no, and no, two. no disrespect to the system or the Raiders sure. or Oakland or the universe. Yeah. But this is just what it was like. Yeah. And so um, much like a, a cattle, because, literally a cattle call. Exactly. It's, because yeah. you're a, a public figure and totally. you're going to be doing charity. But they want to hear how you talk in a microphone. Yeah, they they want to hear how you present yourself. And luckily for me, I saw my dad be very um, charming and know how to say funny things and know how to talk to people. And so I just did my thing, introduced myself. I answer whatever question. I don't remember what it was. And I'm just smiling and do my whole thing. I'm confident. I'm just like, what I got to lose, whatever it is. Then I make it to the second round. It's like, oh, cool, round two. Now you learn to dance. Now they're teaching choreo. Now it's like half. Now there's like 300 girls left. Wow. And, um... We come back, I think it's like over a couple days, I don't remember, but um, we're in this like banquet room yep. at a Hilton yeah. in Oakland. And there's like 300 girls and we're all learning this dance routine and they have the choreographer, she's up on a stage with her Britney Spears microphone <laughs> and she's like five, six, seven, eight, do the choreography right. and whatever. And you know, they have some current Raiderettes up there that are like helping teach the routine, right. which every year Raiderettes have to re-audition. Oh, gosh. And so now I grew up Pop Warner and competitive cheerleading. It's real different. Yeah. It's like stiff arms. Correct. Like a lot of just a lot very of different. bobbing of the ponytail. Yeah. Like yeah. Those very up. different. Yeah. A lot of like open mouth and yeah. yeah. And like very different. <laughs> this is like train dancing. Yeah. Pirouettes. You know, like all these terms I've never heard of. Spot when you turn and yeah. like, what? How do you do this? Um, you know, all, all these different dance things. So at also, this point. Also, was hip hop a thing yet in in dance? I mean, it for, is. Okay. But it's still. It was still new Very the, like, exactly. Ray, blah, right. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You know, step ball, change, yep. turn, blah, blah, blah. All the things. So I'm just like going with it. I'm like, okay, I have no idea what she's saying, but. <laughs> She just flipped, so I'm going to flip it, you know. <laughs> she she just spun around, so I'm going to spin around. <laughs> um, and while we're learning this routine, I'm doing my thing. Like I said, I'm just selling it. I'm just like, I know how to be charming. I know how to be personality. Like, I'm just going to do me. And there is a moment in the, the – she's teaching us this. It's still, till this day, my most favorite and powerful – compliment that I've ever received in my life it's a backhanded compliment but it's a good one um she she jumps off the stage and she like is weaving her way through the crowd no yeah 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 and she has a little Britney Spears like going on and she's weaving her way through the crowd and she comes up to me and she yeah. goes okay clearly <laughs> you have no dance training <laughs> but you have something that cannot be taught <gasps> Bitch, I get goosebumps when I hear I have goosebumps too. I know. And I was just like, thank you. Like, all I heard was the good parts. Right. Because I know I don't have dance training. I have no idea what I'm doing right now. I'm just five, six, seven, eighting. I have rhythm. Right. I can I can do what you're doing. 
Right. But you're not trained that way. Exactly. Exactly. Anyway, so I end up, we all learn to dance. And then you have to perform the dance by yourself in front of the Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. And then, so we do a routine. And then when you find out if you you made it or not. And there's a part we have to put on a gown. And, like, I just put on my old homecoming dress. And (laughs) it's just like, listen, (laughs) I'm 20. So I was just in high school, like, two years ago. (laughs) Um, And I remember when I made the squad. We're all sitting in this room. And they just call off your number. If they call your number, you made it. And there's 50 girls who make the squad. Now there's only 30. But at the time, there's 50 girls who make the squad. And I remember the moment that they called my number. What number were you? Uh, I believe it was 189. Oh, yeah. And when they called my number, my first thought was not, I'm a cheerleader for the Oakland Raiders. My first thought was, I'm going to be an actress. Wow. Because that's, that that's the reason why I'm here. God promised you. This is the only reason why I'm here. It's because I want to be an actress. Mm-hmm. And so I did, I was a cheerleader for one year. Wow. I kept my word to myself. You performed in the Super Bowl. Went to the Super Bowl that year. Like of all years to pick to be a cheerleader for Oakland Raiders. I think I God chose that. One. I you think know God know I mean? chose it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and I came home from the Super Bowl the very next week and I packed up my room in my little station wagon and I drove to L.A., and um, my friend kept her word and she taught me everything. She had me go sign up to be an extra at Central Casting. Um, it was a whole thing. And she re- she gave me like all her hand-me-down clothes because I had nothing. Like I had a pair of Converse and mm-hmm. and my heels from Forever 21. I just bought. <laughs> Which had um, one more walk in them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had like two walks left. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah, and she really, she helped me get headshots she helped me like learn a lot just about the industry and how to be on set and all the things. So that's how I started. It's funny because when you when you tell this story, like I can't imagine you not being this Angela mm. at 10, at 14. <laughs> like you're you're so quick, you're so smart, you're so funny. And it makes sense. Like it's in your genes, it's in your yeah. blood, and it was in the environment around yeah. you. And I'm sure your mom is also a very fascinating woman as well. Yeah, Meaning she's a like charming, lovely lady. Right. But I'm you, like it was it was in you, but mm-hmm. I just find it hard to believe that like you weren't just like this, but small, being like, <laughs> I know how to make everybody laugh. I know how to twist a thing. I know how to tell a story, you know. But that evolution is so interesting mm-hmm. to me. And so Um, You started doing stand-up, which is a very specific skill. Did you have any experience with that kind of making people laugh? No. I didn't know I was funny. I didn't know. I So I knew my dad was funny and we all laugh, but I I didn't know that my dad was different from people. Mm -hmm. I just thought that's normal. That's what you do. You talk to people like this and you make them laugh. When they say this, you say this real fast. No, he's got something you can't teach. Right. And I didn't know that. Right. So when I first moved to L.A. and I was being an extra and I was going out on auditions and like trying to book things here and there, I was going to this church at the time. And on Tuesday, they know that a lot of people at their church are the entertainment industry. So they would offer classes on Tuesday nights. So it'd be like creative arts night. You know, here's an acting class. Here's a dance class. You know, here's a, you know, production class. You can learn how to like edit videos and whatever. And, um... I was in the acting class and we would do improv games Mm -hmm. and I was like funny in all the improv games. And then there was a woman in that class who was about to start her stand-up comedy joke writing class. And so she saw me and she was like, Hey, do you want to come take my joke writing class? And I was like, Oh no, is it free? And she's like, yeah. And I was like, I guess so. I had no desire to be a stand-up comedian at all. And um, I was like, sure, I guess I can do that. And I was like, Oh, I do this like nail salon character there you go. That I bet you I can make that a joke. And she was like, oh, nail salon jokes are so hacky. Everybody has one. I would steer clear from nail salon jokes. And I was like, yeah, but I don't know if anybody does it like me. So I think I'll just give it a go. Mm-hmm. And that joke I wrote in my free joke writing class at a church. And that ended up being the joke that blew up my spot on the internet yep. a year later on this brand new thing called YouTube. And propelled me into where I am today. I'd like to hear Jonathan's kind of um, analysis of this because what I hear 
is that there's something really powerful to a dream that you had mm -hmm. and a dream that you also kept because mm -hmm. it didn't feel safe, mm -hmm. right? I mean, mm -hmm. in, in a lot of ways it wasn't. I don't mean yeah. it was dangerous. I just sure. mean like it didn't feel like it had a place. Yeah. And you kept kind of putting one foot in front of the other, yeah. but with your own. And also I, I do want to get to sort of the faith component yeah. because I think a lot of people don't have that connection. And it, in your case, that was who knew the plan, mm -hmm. meaning that was who mm -hmm. knew the promise, the dream, the plan, all yeah. of it. Yeah. But you moved like one step at a time in such a like specific way mm -hmm. that was also in theory, very chaotic, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning there was no training. First of all, I want a free joke writing class at church. <laughs> like that seems perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and also you didn't listen when someone says, oh, that's hacky. You were like, had the confidence of self-knowledge to be like, wait a second, what I'm thinking about is different than how they're yeah. imagining it. Yeah. And actually that I resonate with the most because so many times in my life I've experienced that, wait, that's not exactly what I mean. Or you don't quite see what I uh -huh. see and like, let's further explain it or like take it to a next level. The other thing I do on this podcast a lot is refer back to previous episodes, both to pitch people to go listen to the previous episodes, but also, you know, we've done this a while and like there are some themes that continue. And one of the themes here is like the Michael Singer, the author of The Untethered Soul. He talks a lot about living in a way where you're taking the next action. You're saying mm. yes to that next opportunity. And so for you to be like, I never imagined being a stand-up comic to where your life is now you're like, oh, that's a pretty big, like, how did you get there? And it's like, oh, you just took that next door that opened there. You were given that opportunity and there was one more thing for you to go through. And then, oh, it's that character. It's like those small yeses that lead us to a much larger endpoint. That is very interesting. And you said something that triggered a thought for me. Um, so like when she was like, oh, nail salon jokes are so hacky, steer clear of that. It's interesting to me how a lot of times I wish I had that boldness, bravery, and audacity all the time throughout my entire career because then I'll be in a meeting or whatever and it's like we're pitching a show and I'm with producers or people who have done this way longer than me and I wish I had some of that girl that was like, when, when they tell me like, this idea has been done before, mm -hmm. but that's not how it works. Mm. How many times I've heard, but that's not how it works. Mm. Right. And I, I go, Oh, okay. You've been doing it longer than me. Mm -hmm. Then let's, let's do it your way. Right. How I become this person as I've gotten a little bit of success as I've, um, been a little more jaded or whatever in the industry. It's interesting how I remember that girl who had nothing to lose and who was confident in what she was saying. But I'm saying this to a teacher who's someone who's teaching a class and like, I'm the teacher and I'm telling you, this is hacky. People have done it. And then I have the audacity to be like, yeah, but they don't do it like me. I wish I had more of her still when I'm in these meetings and they're like, that's not how it works at Netflix. And I'm like, well, that's how it works with me. And I think you should, like, I wish I still had some of her. That it's not how it works is people cannot imagine things until they see them. Mime and I talked a lot about this when she was writing her script for her movie and we wrote a pilot together. And like, it was always like, they don't understand. People are so yeah. linear and I've seen it in business and I've seen it in the entertainment industry. And I've seen it even when people are trying to like imagine something, when you try to describe it and it doesn't yeah. exist, the failure of it being this concrete example, like when you hold up a page and it's exactly what it is, people can be like, oh, I can kind of imagine it. But in the absence of that, people are horrifically limited and it prevents people like you and other creatives from being able to say, wait a second, that isn't what I mean. And, oh, you've made this association. It's a, it's a nail salon. It's not a, that nail salon joke that you're thinking about. And it's, you know, because we try to attach the closest piece of familiar uh, n concept that we have to anything. And that ultimately prevents a lot of great things from being born. Yes, Jonathan. And the thing that 
you know, draws me to you just as someone who watches you and, you know, again, was a fan before I got to meet you backstage at your concert. Um, you know, there's something about you that's very unapologetic. And, you know, it feels so cliche to be like, she's an unapologetic woman. Like, I don't mean it in that, like, cliche way. What I mean is that, and this is throughout your book as well, like, this is who I am. So don't tell me what the rules are. Don't tell me you're not supposed to, you know, that if... Don't tell me that if you believe in God, you can't also be sexy. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me mm -hmm. that if you don't have sex before marriage, you don't know how to make love. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like mm -hmm. this is who you yeah. are. And it's funny because um, that's something, the reason that I am drawn to you as a viewer is because I don't have that. You know, I, I'm, I feel like I'm always kind of like falling over myself, you know, in places where I need to not be. And it's it's a lot of, I think, for women in our industry and for like strong women, it's like finding your voice, right? And sometimes I'll use it way too much where it doesn't belong because it's all those like hurt feelings and resentment and like, you know, but when you were talking, what it reminded me of, and this might be my issue and not yours, or we may share it or whatever. For me, I relive a lot of my childhood with every adult that I interact with as an adult. So like when I'm told that's not how we do it, it's my dad, like, you know, and it's my mom who did the best that they could. And they were hilarious, like very, very funny, very smart, very quirky. But, you know, it's them kind of doing what their parents like. We're all just getting sort of what's been handed down to us. And a lot of what you were talking about, I feel also when I'm in a room with what feels like grownups. Mm. It's usually older yes. white men. It's yes. usually older white men. I have no problem with older white men. But when I'm in that situation, it's very easy for me to fall into that. Yes. And it's like, I, I just, I, I mean, I talk about this a lot. Like how much of our adult lives is really just kind of reenacting even good childhoods, even yeah. loving homes. Yep. How much are we just sort of like replaying those tropes? And I don't mm -hmm. know if you ever thought about it, but it's like in those meetings, that's where I go. I've never thought about it, but as you're talking, I'm realizing I am subconsciously assigning mom, dad, siblings even, right? Teacher yeah. at school, principal, like I am assigning people an authority role over me. And I'm coming in like I'm 40 years old, but I'm coming in like I'm this little kid and I'm like, OK, here's my presentation. Give me a good grade. Right. And what they say goes. They're the boss. And what they say is then the authority. Uh, that That's yeah. truth. I yeah. still have that. And I have, you know, I'm grateful. I have spiritual guidance. I have people that I go to who remind me just be here it is. Just because someone says something doesn't mean it's true. Right. And like that is mind blowing to me because yeah. where I come from, especially like immigrant family, like what the grown up says goes because it's your survival. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Yeah. This is how we live. This is how we hide. Uh -huh. This is how we save money. Like, yeah. and I, I joke that I was raised like my parents were like, I'll tell you when you're hungry. I'll tell you when you're happy and I'll tell you when you're cold. Mm -hmm. Like put on this jacket, eat what's on your plate. We may not eat again mm -hmm. for many, many hours. Mm -hmm. Right. That's how so many of us also structure it. And I think it happens in all families. Yeah. And I also, it's funny because my husband and I talk about like, um, both of us came from very humble beginnings. And there's a lot of times like with our business manager who our financial advisor, they are very much assigned mom, dad. Role. Oh, hundred percent. They are my parents. Hey, Jonathan refers to mine as can, my parents. Can we afford this? Is it okay? <laughs> Is it okay if yes. we buy this? And they're like, it's your money. <laughs> um, but we very are like, if me and my husband were talking about like a big purchase, he's like, I don't know, let's call Roger first <laughs> and ask him if it's okay. <laughs> like, what? So it's like, I think we subconsciously are assigning people mom, dad figures over us. Yeah. Well, and I think that that's a, a great place that I want to get into um, your marriage and what's neat about following your comedy is you see kind of your life progress, you know, over the years um, of of being with um, with your husband. He's a Christian rapper. He was. He was a Christian rapper. Yeah. But at the time of your of certain specials, yeah. um, he was a Christian rapper, which just like the material that you produce just from those two words yeah. together, like yeah. Christian and rapper was so amazing. Embarrassing. Yeah. Um, well, not embarrassing, though. Like, just <laughs> I mean, it was fantastic. Thank you. Comedy. It 
was fascinating also. Um, so you have three podcasts and one of them is, is you and him. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd also just like to point out, it's called Mangela. Mm-hmm. Adorable. Manuel and Angela. Yeah. That's right. It's the cutest. Thank you so much. Um, and so that is, is one of your podcasts and, um, you have a very honest relationship, at mm -hmm. least from you yeah. know the the information that you choose to present, yeah. both in your specials and like in the in the book. Um, and I I do want to kind of um, lean into the fact that you you've mentioned your faith and mm -hmm. you've mentioned you know sort of the role that you always sensed. It sounds yeah. like for the most part that you know like God um, had and has you know in your life. Did you meet in a Christian way? My roommate at the time was getting married. I went to her wedding and I saw this hot guy there and I was like, oh my God, who's this guy? Like somebody introduced me to him and nobody introduced me to him. And um, turns out he didn't even notice me that day. Um, He's an exceptionally attractive man also. Very I, I, good looking. I can't imagine him walking among us. Very good looking. Like at it's a wedding, I'd be like, what is happening? Yeah. Yeah, it was. It was very like, what is that? <laughs> and... um. He did not notice me because he only liked white girls at the time. So it, a very specific type of white girl, a white girl who listens to hip hop music, like one of those kind of white girls who like know knows all the lyrics to, you know, all, all, all the songs. Anyways, um, so he didn't even notice me. I went home that day. I cyber stalked him on the Internet. I went to my friend who got married that day to her Facebook page, clicked on her new husband's Facebook page. I went through every single one of his friends until this I is found. This feeling very Christian. It's very yeah, Christian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Until I found that afro that I saw <laughs> at the wedding. And I was like, boom, got him. And then I, like, researched him. I found out he was Christian. He was in a band. Um, he was touring, like, all these things. And I was like, oh, my gosh, like, dream world. Hello. Mm. I love the Lord. He loves the Lord. Like, <laughs> yes. And um, I didn't message him or anything. I didn't even tell my friend that I looked him up. You kept that dream inside. I, I'm real good at tucking things away. Mm. I'm real, real good at like, ooh, I want this. But you know, I'm just going to tuck it away right here. <laughs> um, and I just let it go. I didn't do Facebook poke. I didn't do nothing. I just went on with my life and was like, snooze you lose, sir. You should have met me because I'm a catch. Mm. And I moved on with my life for two years. I just went and like dated a bunch of duds for two years. <laughs> And then I get a phone call out of the blue one day. It was a text message from my friend that got married that day. I hadn't talked to her in a long time at this point. And she sent me a text. She was like, is this still Angela's number? And I was like, yeah. And she's like, um, call me back. I want to hook you up with somebody. And I had just gotten out of a, a relationship with a guy who was like super Christian and would say like all the Christian words, but he was like very manipulative and real toxic. And I just gotten out of a relationship with him and I was like, S who do you want to hook me up? I was like annoyed at this point. Who, what, why, who is it? And she was like, I don't know if he's your type, but look him up on Facebook. His name is Manuel <laughs> Reyes. And as soon as she said his name, like all my research came flooding back to me. And I was like, Doo -doo 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 I was like, all right, I'll look him up. I'll see. I already knew. I already knew exactly who he was. And I was like, all right, I'll check. And I was like, it's about time. Two years later, wow. finally. And um, so she connected us. We started chatting on Facebook because he was living in Florida at the time. He was on tour. I was on tour. And um, so we started Skyping because this is right, before, <laughs> before FaceTime was a thing. So we're Skyping each other and Facebook messages. And that's how our relationship started. Like, he was in a hotel room. I was in a hotel room. He was in a green room. I was in a green room. And we would just Skype each other. And so we met in August. We became officially boyfriend and girlfriend, circle yes or no, mm -hmm. um, in October. Mm -hmm. And then we were engaged on Christmas Eve. Wow. And then we got married in June. Wow. We hadn't even known each other for a, a year, full year. Right. And we were already married. And this is coming from, like, he's a player. I have commitment issues. Like, I'm just dating around. Like, nobody's serious. Not bringing anybody home to my family. Being like, this is my boyfriend. Like, none of that. Just, like, out here living my life. Like, I'm working. I'm chasing my dreams. Like, I'm CEO of me. I'm doing me right now. And then we got married very quickly. We're, it's like the total cliche when you know, you know. And it was like, oh, yeah. This feels different. This is it. And we're going on... 12 years this wow. coming up. Did you feel like 
your God had a hand in that or even in just sort of that guidance? What does that feel like to have that kind of relationship with God? Like for sure. So I am an avid journaler. I I have stacks and stacks of journals Same. and my journals are sometimes just me documenting my day. Sometimes it's my prayers. Sometimes I'm talking to God in my journals. Sometimes I'm just talking to myself and documenting. And, um, I remember like falling for this guy really quickly and thinking like, Oh, it's moving too fast. Like it's not how it works. And I remember I got advice from a friend of mine and she was like, just follow peace. Hmm. If peace says slow down, it's moving too fast, then slow down. But if peace says you're fine, then stay on track where you're going. You don't need to slow down because society says it's too fast or because your past history says it's too fast. You follow peace. If peace in your soul and your spirit is you're right where you're supposed to be, keep going, then keep doing that. And so I did. And then it moved very quickly. And um, I feel like... I definitely talked to God a lot during that time and was like, same kind of thing. God is the entertainment industry for me. Give me a sign. God is this guy for me. And I knew when I loved him, I would, I, it took me a few days to write it in my journal. I, (laughs) it was like, I knew on a Monday, but I didn't write it until probably like Thursday or Friday (laughs) because I couldn't even bring myself to write it in my journal. And then finally I was like, I think I love this guy. Like this is, this feels different. God, wow. what is this God? What are you doing? Hmm. What's happening? Yeah. If we don't, let's say we don't call that God. Mm-hmm. What is it? Meaning, is it, you know, is it intuition? Is it like, like, what is it? Intuition. Hmm. I think whether you want to call it God or not, I think we all have a knowing in our, our own spirit, in our own self. When you are in alignment with truth, truth of who you are, truth of um, what you're capable of, truth of your value, truth of your worth, truth of who you are in the world. When you are in alignment with that, and we all step out of alignment daily, weekly, monthly, whatever it is, you can be like on a roll and then all of a sudden you're doubting yourself and you're insecure one day and then you bring yourself back into alignment with truth. And you're like, oh no, I'm right where I'm supposed to be. Like I am, I am enough. I'm educated enough. Yeah, I didn't I never finished college, but I'm educated enough. I am uh smart enough, I'm beautiful enough. I am all the things enough, right? I am talented enough, I am gracious enough, I am kind, I am all the things. I am enough, right? When you bring yourself back into alignment of truth of who you are and you you're operating your life out of that alignment and truth, I think there's an intuition, a confidence in that. And when you're like, your life is messy and you're in a state of like insecurity or doubt or like all the things then I, I think it's harder to be in touch with that totally intuition and knowing in your own spirit, whether you call it God or self. That's a very, very, that's a beautiful explanation. Thank you. You know, this is just my sickness. It's not your fault. You know, where I go is no, but like where I go is like, well, why can't I have that? Like what was missing? Mm. You know why? Like, what, whatever. Like, I mean, I, I'm a compare and despair person. I specialize mm-hmm. in comparing and despairing. Um, no, but do you know what I mean, Jonathan? I'm like, I, I want to be like, what if I had grown up in her house? What mm. if you had more siblings, you know, and I was there? Like, would I have, would that have just been in the water? You know, would, would I have just seen it from like being with your dad and your mom? You know, we're all different and I have my own blessings and challenges yeah. and, you know, but, um, you know, that, that's what I, like, I want that. And also I'm, uh, I have a God, I have a God of my understanding. My first sentence was, you know, the prayer that we recite when, you know, when you're a toddler, you learn to say that God is one, like Uh. that's it. Right. So like my first sentence was God and I've never really not believed it. Just like I've never stopped believing in gravity. I didn't have Mm -hmm. a teenage phase where I was like, gravity doesn't exist. But like people are very comfortable being like, God doesn't exist. Like, okay. Mm. Anyway. Yeah. (laughs) So, um, but I definitely, I don't, um, and, and there are paths uh, in traditional Judaism where you use kind of specific texts for personal development that uh-huh. feels a lot like that. Yeah. Um, it's just never a path that I've, you know, taken, but yeah. I really want that. Jonathan, don't I want that? You definitely want it. And you know what's funny? As you're like, what if I grew up in your household, right? What's interesting is I didn't grow up with affirmation with 
any of that positive reinforcement. So I'm just doomed because I didn't no, get it for myself. <laughs> it's, I feel like trauma mm. taught me a lot. And uh, me getting into therapy because of trauma, mm. educating myself in those ways, being open to aspects of faith. Like we didn't grow up Christian until my parents got divorced. Once they got divorced, then we started going into church and stuff like that. But I feel like, so I learned a lot, like as a teenager going into like youth group and like uh, learning elements of faith and how to put your faith in, in God and in our world, like it was Christian world, like how to, you know, we read these scriptures, we quote these scriptures and like, this is what it means, how it pertains to our life and like all that kind of stuff. So we learn how to apply these stories and these principles to our own lives. And then like we, we stand on these, these scriptures as our like foundation and stuff. And then I've evolved even from that to where I, I'm so grateful for my upbringing in faith, but I also see where it was limiting right. and where it was traumatic and where it caused damage. And I'm able to deconstruct that and be like, oh, this was amazing that I learned from Christianity. Oh, this, I'm going to hold on to this. This part right here, that's real toxic. That's got to go somewhere. That was not the Lord. That was man-made yep. religious trauma right there. Um, so I feel like trauma was a gift to then get help for it. If I didn't experience this trauma, I wouldn't seek this type of help and I wouldn't have learned these types of things. You've referred to your dad as, you know, obviously a huge part of your your comedy, your mm -hmm. timing. Um, but you do also talk about some of the challenges yeah. and you use the, the, you know, the word trauma to describe yeah, it. Yeah. Um, is this something that you've worked through? Is it something you've worked through on your own? Is it something you've worked through with him? Uh, with therapy, for sure. And um, one year... I decided to talk to my dad about it. I was talking to a friend of mine on her podcast and we were talking about our own traumatic past, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then I started feeling guilty that I was sharing this with her and the world. And I had never mm -hmm. had a conversation with my dad about uh, the trauma that has been caused in my life because of his actions. Mm -hmm. And she was like, maybe you should talk to him one day. And I was like, yeah, right. And she was like, no, you should like sit down and have a conversation with your dad mm -hmm. one day. And I was like, all right, well, if it ever works out and we're in the same city, because he doesn't live in Los Angeles. So I was like, we're in the same city. Sure, I'll have a talk with him. Two days later, he texts me and is like, hey, I'm driving uh, to Phoenix. I'm going to stop in LA. Mm. Love to see you. And I was like, oh, shit, it's going down. Mm. Well, this is about to happen. So then I call my cousin, who is also like my therapist. He's been sober for 30 years. He's mm -hmm. been in therapy his whole life. He sponsors people. And mm -hmm. he has been, he was my first therapist before I actually like mm -hmm. paid to go see therapy. Right. And like, he was teaching me all the things, how to like communicate my feelings, how to process my feelings, how to articulate, how to own my feelings. Like they don't make you feel this way. Like you got to own your, all the things. Um, and so I worked it out with him and with my therapist. And he's like, I think you should write your dad a letter and, you know, put it out there. Therapy sandwich, positive, negative, positive, all the things. And I'm writing out everything from never hearing, I'm proud of you, never hearing any of those types of things to, um, him competing with me to, um, verbally abusive, physically abusive, like all the things growing up. And, um, it was to the point where I had to call my mom and my sister and be like, are these stories true? Or am I making this up? Mm -hmm. And they're both like, Oh no, that really happened. Mm -hmm. And then they would tell me other stories that I forgot about. And I was like, Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. No, this conversation definitely needs to happen. And I was so nervous. And I remember, um, again, like intuition, like leaning into that and being like, okay, when do I do it? When do I talk mm -hmm. to my dad about this? And in my mind, I saw this visual of my dad sitting at my coffee table in the morning, drinking his coffee. And I was like, okay, when I see him there, I'm going to have a talk with him. So he gets there, we're eating dinner. We hit watch episode of a show that I was on. And this is how my dad gives me encouragement. I did an episode of um, Superstore. Mm -hmm. And we watched the episode. I show my dad. And he's like, they didn't give you any of the funny parts. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, what? No, you just don't get it, dad. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, mm. 
But anyways, we go to sleep. Next morning, I come downstairs. He's and I, sitting at the table. He's sitting at the coffee table by himself, just drinking his coffee. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, shit. Okay, heart's beating fast. I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, let me go get my, my journal. I get it. And I go sit down. And I was like, Dad, I wrote you a letter. And I'm going to read it to you. And this is the first time you've kind of tackled this with him. Ever. Ever. I said, I wrote you a letter. I'm going to read it to you. And he's like, okay. And I was like, I want you to not say anything Mm -hmm. during this letter. Just listen. Just listen. Afterwards, you can ask me questions. We could talk about Mm -hmm. it. I don't want you to say anything. And he's like, okay. I start reading my letter. The whole time I'm reading it, what? Wow. I don't remember that. (sighs) When? Like all of these things, right? But I'm like, just keep reading. I'm not even going to comment to what he's saying. I'm just going to keep going. And I read my whole letter. You kept your eyes down? And Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I finished my letter. And he was like, well, oh, and one thing me and my, my therapist talked about. Best, worst, and medium outcome from this. Mm-hmm. Worst outcome he storms out of the room. I never talked to him again. Okay. Fractures our relationship forever, and I never talked to my dad again. Okay. Um, best outcome, he's completely apologetic. <laughs> right. Cannot believe that he hurt me so, and is like, how do I make this better? <laughs> right. Medium outcome is like... Anything in between. <laughs> I'm sorry. Hey, it is what it is, right? Great. I'll take that. Please, just don't give me the, the bad one. Mm-hmm. So after he, he's done, he's listening, he stands up and he goes, hey, give me a hug. I don't remember a lot of that, but I believe you. Wow. And I, I'm sorry. I just raised you the way I was raised. And, and then he goes on to say things that are like fully as my therapy brain. I'm like, oh, you're <laughs> in your denial. He was like, when my dad used to beat me, I was grateful. That's right. I was grateful because he he showed he cared about me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, really? You were grateful as you were getting beat down? Mm -hmm. No, you weren't. Mm -hmm. Like, but that's his protective. Correct. Well, that's the reality that that generation often has to construct. Sure. So it was like a whole thing. But also in that conversation, I realized, and it's something not, I don't want to generalize that generation but I feel like it has a lot to do with that generation. My dad does not have the capacity Mm -mm. to understand his own trauma and the trauma he has caused. Correct. So in this moment, it was not necessarily me trying to get him to understand. It was me just letting him know. Right. And I think when I released myself Mm -hmm. of needing him to understand and own what he did to Mm -hmm. me in my life when that was the weight of that was gone it was like I can actually have a great relationship with you now wow I don't need you to own anything because I know your capacity Mm -hmm. and unfortunately you can't that's you right. don't understand. And that's not a judgment also. And, you know, when I mean, my mom listens. Hi, mom. Um, and, you know, I remember even when I became vegetarian, you know, when I left my parents home, it was like, what? What what we did wasn't OK. What you think you're going to do better? You know, like mm-hmm. meaning anything we do that breaks out of those pattern, like whatever the pattern is. Right. Oh, yeah. Depending on the family structure, it's always going to rub the yeah. wrong way. And then you take into account, like you said, well, what was their childhood like? Yeah. What trauma did they experience? What wars did they see, right? Like, what did mm-hmm. they see? What battles, what wars did they see in their home and in the world, right? But it doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be a confrontation Yeah. in that, you know, just like we were saying, like, this is who, like, the way I see you saying, like, mm-hmm. this is who I am. That's also who other people are. Yeah. So if I'm going to give myself that grace yep. to say, like, I'm where Absolutely. I need to be, I get to do the work. They also have the dignity to make their own decisions about oh, their yeah. growth. Like, yeah. that's really what. A, also, it's not always like that, people. I don't want people yeah. to be like, I tried the Angela thing and it blew up <laughs> in my face. Um, but it sounds like you had incredible, thoughtful support around it. Yeah. Also, you have a relationship with writing. 
yeah. with expressing your feelings yeah. and with a concept of something bigger than yourself yeah. that you have really integrated into your path. So I'm not saying the only way you can do these kind of things is if you're a religious person, sure. but the framework that you had yeah. was very, very t time yeah. tested in terms yeah, of the yeah, structure yeah. of how you organize, you know, confrontation yeah. and outcomes. It's yeah. really, really Years beautiful. of therapy yeah. definitely helped with that. And I'll tell you one last thing of something that I learned about my relationship with my dad and him never saying like, I'm proud of you. You did a great job. Anything like that. When I first started doing stand up comedy at the church, um, the graduation, right? We did that. Then there was a, a variety show at church and there was dancing, acting, singing. And at the time I live with my friends in this apartment and they're all like dancers, actors and stuff like that. And so um, I'm in the variety show and I do my stand up. And my dad drives down with his friend and they come to the, the variety show and they come to see us perform. And so I did my set and then my roommate, my best friend, she, she was in the show. She was dancing. She's a dancer. Right. And, um, so after the show, I see my dad and nothing, no, Hey, great job. Oh, that was awesome. Nothing. Like, even if you didn't think it was funny, Just say something. <laughs> It was like, like, hey, you did it. <laughs> Proud nothing. Mm. It was just like, hey, how's it going? Yeah. Oh, hi, dad. Right. And then I remember the pastor walks up and the pastor says to my dad, he was like, hey, you must be proud. There it is. And then my dad, who's a jokester, and I get it. He was being funny guy. Yeah. He goes, yeah, when she's hosting the Oscars one day, then I'll be proud. Oh. And then my pastor goes, well, you got to start somewhere, you know. And then he's like, you know, he's cracking jokes because that's what he does. Yeah. It's protection also. I mean, it's that's total protection. Right. So then I'm like, OK, I think my dad just doesn't know how to give compliments. <laughs> I think it's just he doesn't know how to say it. Like the words don't come out like he just doesn't know how to give compliments. That's fine. It's whatever. Anyways, so we get home back to my apartment. And I'm with my dad. His friend is there. Whatever. We're all hanging out. And then my my friend gets home who is also in the variety I show. I know what you're going to say. She was dancing in the show. I know it's going to happen. <laughs> she walks in the door and my dad lights up. Yes. Hey. Oh my <gasps> God. You were incredible. <laughs> wow. Like I, it was beautiful. <laughs> Just lavishing her. He knows how to give a compliment. Friend. He knows how to give a compliment. And I was like, what? I was so mad and I was hurt. Oh. I go, I leave immediately and I go into the bathroom and I call my mom on the phone and I'm like crying in the bathroom. I'm a grown adult at this point. Yeah. I'm like 20 something years old. I think I'm like 27. And I call my mom and I'm in the bathroom on the phone and I'm like crying and I'm like telling her like what just happened. And she goes, stop expecting him That's it. to be that for you. Stop expecting the encouragement, expecting the love, expecting the affirmation. Stop needing that from him because you will never get That's it. Right. And it was like so hurtful. And it was, I talked about it in therapy for years and years and years. And then I had, came to this realization that was released me from so much. I would talk to all my dad's family, his friends. Mm -hmm. Anytime I'd get on the phone with my aunt or a friend of my dad's, Hey, your dad's so proud of you. He talks about you all the time. Mm. I go, really? He didn't tell me this. Like, oh, he's so proud when you did this and that. Mm. And I was like, really? Wow. He didn't tell me any of that. And then I realized my dad <clears throat> grew up charming, athletic, mm -hmm. life of the party, star of the show. When my dad is telling other people about his daughter. <laughs> He's winning. That's right. He's still winning because this is my daughter. When he's telling me... You're winning. I'm winning. And he's not ready for that. No. Mm. I also want to mention the second podcast that we can um, give a shout out to. <laughs> 
Knights at the Round Table, which is religion and spirituality. Um, and the, the premise is this podcast was birthed over nights of wine, good food, and good friends. We talk about faith, love, relationships, and the deconstruction of them all. Um, sounds really, really awesome. And I, I'm assuming that is a place. That's yeah. a safe place you oh, know, yeah. to explore that. Oh, yeah. But it really is the third podcast that we need to talk about. Yeah. Because... You you talk about ghost stories. Let's talk about this podcast and why it's on hiatus. Tell me about it. Um, I've always been fascinated with paranormal stuff since I was a kid. I love scary, spooky things. Mm -hmm. I remember being a kid going to my grandma's house in Reno, Nevada. And she, this is like 80s VHS tapes. Yeah. And she had all the movies. Like she collected all the movies. Right. And so at night... We would all, we would pick a movie and we'd all watch the movie together. Then everybody would go to sleep, but mm -hmm. I would stay up mm -hmm. and I would watch a scary movie. It was like The Blob. Right. Night of the Living Dead, like original. Yeah, Night like of the Living hardcore, Dead. old school. Um, like I would watch all the scary movies and, and, and then I would have to walk by myself down the dark hallway to the guest bedroom. I don't I like this. In. Yeah, it was real, real scary. I like to scare myself. Um, so I've always been fascinated with haunted houses, like not Halloween haunted house, like actual, like something demonic happened in this house. Like I, Oh, Winchester mystery house also is oh, in yeah. San Jose. One of the most famous strange houses. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. I did a photo shoot there. One of course day. you I'll did. tell you about it. Um, <laughs> so anyways, always been fascinated with paranormal ghosty stuff, but also growing up um, Christian, you're taught that it's bad. Right. It's don't de don't mess with that stuff. Don't open it's, the door. And it's actually, it's, uh, it's Old Testament, uh, religious Jews as well. Um, you do not dabble in numerology or oh. astrology or like all that stuff. Isn't is, that crazy? Oh yeah, Vodazara. It's uh so yeah, it's actually it's, Isn't that it's so basis crazy is Judeo Christian. That the wise yes. men like followed the stars to get to Jesus. But then we but, stop. But don't look at the stars no more. That's right. And also like the Hebrew language and Aramaic, every letter is a number. So the whole Bible is numbers. And wow. certain words have different number values and if you mix them together but we don't talk about it anymore uh -uh. No, because no. it was there, culturally, there was a lot of other groups that were yeah. using that as their primary worship, uh -huh. and the Jews and the Christians were like, we're different than them, I promise. Yeah. Okay, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like bad stuff. I, I remember any time I'd be like super into like my scary movies, and like I would go, I would look up where there was something haunted, and I would go drive there and like try this to This was like, like your porn. <laughs> yeah, it totally was, totally my porn. <laughs> And then I would have like people from my church that would be like, this is bad. You need to like repent. You need to like give this to the Lord, like all that kind of stuff. And um, so anyways, then I started like deconstructing and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna do my ghost stories. <laughs> and um, this also was birthed out of 2020 COVID. Mm -hmm. And the I would The scariest go, shit anyone had experienced. Yeah, I would go on Instagram live and I would sit by my fireplace in the backyard and I would go live with fans on Instagram and they would tell me their actual real I don't ghost like stories. It. No, it makes me scared. So they would tell me I would have one celebrity guest and then I would go live with like three random fans that I would just pick and they would tell me their ghost stories. And um, the most wild story was Joe Coy's story. Um, I have oh. it on YouTube if you go check it out. Um, it's not great footage quality because we're Instagram live. So it wasn't like great camera stuff. It's a wild story. It's the, the wildest story I've ever heard. Um, but anyway, so that's how it started. And then we turned it into like an actual podcast. And then I would go go live with people and people are like live streaming, watching oh and they're giving gosh. comments and stuff like that. So we did a bunch of episodes. It was super fun. People were very into it. And then I had to go on hiatus because a creepy thing happened. What happened? <sighs> so... Is this for real? Are you just trying to scare No, me? this is for real. Like I haven't brought my podcast back because... Of this because I, I'm trying to figure out how to do it and be safe. So I am, um, and I have it on, I have it recorded. I'll send you the video if you want to watch it. I cry now. It's like with the toothbrush. Is that, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no toothbrushes were involved. Um, so I would record the episode wherever I was. If I was in LA, Nashville, because I live in Nashville as well. Like wherever I was, I'm recording this episode. So um, there's this one night I'm doing the episode. It's like Tuesday night. Um, and I'm realizing my husband's out of town. It's just me. Our studio is in the back house, right? So I'm realizing it's going to be like 8 p.m. dark. And I have to walk by myself no. from the front house to the back house, right? Then by the time I'm done with the podcast, now it's going to be like Even almost darker. 10 p.m. Right. Right? 
The witching hour. <laughs> yeah. And it's just like forest all around. It's just like trees, nature. It's dark. No lights. Nothing. And I'm psyching myself out. I was like, oh, my God. I forgot I'm by myself and it's going to be dark and I have to like lock up the studio by myself. Ugh, whatever. Anyways. So I go. I'm in the studio. We're recording. My producer is virtual. He's in Phoenix. I'm in Nashville. We go live. I have my my guest that I'm I'm live with. I'm interviewing my guest. He's telling me about his story growing up. He always had these like two spirits that would like follow him like through his childhood. Now he's an adult and he always had one was a woman, one was a man. He always had them. He's telling me his story. And I go, you should meet my friend. He's a psychic medium. I start talking about my friend. I go, you should meet my friend, AJ Barrera. He's a psychic medium. As soon as I say that, I hear something in my headphone. And I, I kept talking for like two more words. And then I was like, wait, did you just say something? Stop. And he goes, no. And I go, you swear? You didn't whisper something right now? And he's like, no. And I was like, I just heard something in my headphones. Then all the comments on the section. No. I just heard it. No. I definitely heard no. something. Everybody starts no. commenting that they all heard something. And I was like, so I tell my producer, I was like, hey, make a note of this, like time code and go back and listen and tell me if you could hear anything. So I just finished the interview like and I'm like kind of freaked out a little bit. I was like, I definitely heard something in my headphone. I was like, OK, just finish the interview and then lock up the studio, scared like my eight year old self at my grandma's house in Reno, just like walking down the scary hallway. Now I'm like walking back into my house and I'm like by myself and it's like dark. I'm like, let me just hurry up and go to bed. Cause once you get in the bed, put the covers on, no more monsters could get you. Is you that know what right? I mean? Like that's how it works. Is that how it works? <laughs> that's how it works. No more monsters could get you once you under the covers. So I was like, let me just hurry up and get to bed. So then I'm in my bed, right? And my producer sends me the clip. No. And then I, I play it and you hear something. And I'm like, oh, my God, I knew it. I knew something happened. So then I'm texting my mom. I'm like, here's a clip. Look at it. Because she watched all my episodes. And I was like, here's a clip. Tell me, what do you think it says? Texting to my brother, Kenny. Oh, my God, here's a clip. Then I call my other brother, Mitchell. And I'm like in bed at this point. I was like, Mitchell, I'm going to send you this video right now. This just happened on my podcast. As I'm talking to him, my, no. my Google soundbar turns on. Bloop, bloop. And I was like, oh, no. Oh, I, Mitchell, I got to go. I got to hang up. Oh, my God. I don't know what's happening. And then I hang up. And I was like, I need to hurry up and get this. And then I start rebuking everything. I'm learning. I'm taking all my Christian teachings from growing up. I'm like, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. Like, all the things. <laughs> and I was like, I need to go to sleep. So I text my friend, the psychic medium. And I was like, bro, something happened on my podcast. Call me back. I need to tell you about it. He didn't call me back until, like, the next evening. So, I'm sorry. You went to sleep? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How? I, you know, I don't know. I've trained myself since I was a kid on watching and experiencing scary things and going to sleep. I would burn the house down. Oh, no, it gets, wor it gets just... worse. It gets worse. So then my friend finally calls me back. And I was like, bro, this scary thing happened on my podcast. I heard something. He goes, okay, send me the clip. And I was like, I heard some, some somebody said something. And he goes, okay, was it a man or a woman? I was like, I don't know. I, I can't like tell. This. And he was like, hey, what'd they say? I was like, I don't know. I can't tell. And he's like, all right, send me the clip. I text him the clip. He's now, he calls me back and he tells me this. He's, he's with his wife and he presses play and he listens to it. His wife doesn't know anything. All she knows is somebody sent him a clip and he's watching it. She's listening. She goes, it sounds like they said Angela. And he goes, oh, that's funny because Angela Johnson is the one who just texted me this. No. So then he calls me back and he goes, it's whispering your name. No. And I'm like, shut your mouth. And he's like, yeah, it definitely said your name. So then he starts doing all his like, okay, is it the anniversary of a death coming up? Somebody you know, do you know about like it? Just it. like all the different things. I don't like it. And then we even we slowed it down, and you can hear it like slow mo. It's wild. And so I'm like, shut up. So now I'm like hella freaked out. And he's like, we after doing some investigative, you know, questioning, he's like, I think it's your grandma. My grandma had just passed away like a month before. When I found out she passed away, I was in that studio. I did all my journaling about her in that studio. Like all the things when I was processing her death, it was all in that studio. And so it was like, I think it's your grandma. And I was like, Okay. So then now the third day, now I'm, I'm driving, I'm in Nashville. It's like a hot, beautiful, sunny day. I'm driving my car down the freeway. I'm on Bluetooth. I'm never going to sleep again. <laughs> I just want you to know that. Like that last night was my last night of sleep. <laughs> 
I'm on Bluetooth with my mom. I'm talking to my mom. I'm telling her what happened and what the psychic guy said. And I was like, yeah, he said it might be grandma, blah, blah, blah. Like, not her mom. It's my dad's mom. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, he said it might be my grandma, blah, blah, blah. As I'm telling her the story, all of a sudden my windshield wipers just turn on by themselves. It's a sunny, beautiful day. It's not raining. It's not misty. It's not anything. Just shoo, shoo. And I was like, oh, hell no. Oh, my God. And I'm telling her. She's like, well... Just start asking your grandma some questions. Maybe she's around you. So I hang up with my mom and I'm like, okay, grandma. You're driving. I'm driving down the highway in Nashville, Tennessee. And I'm like, okay, grandma, if this is you and you're trying to tell me something, like, what are you trying to tell me? And I'm like looking for signs at this point. I'm looking at license plates. I'm looking at billboards. I'm like, what? Is there a message somewhere? Like, I got no messages. I didn't, I don't know what she was saying. And that was like pretty much the last creepy thing that happened in that. But ever since then, I did one more episode after that. And I had a friend with me in the studio. I'm like, I'm not doing this by myself. And then ever since then, I was like, let me just take a beat real quick gather myself and I have not been able to bring myself back to do the podcast yet. Like I have to really figure out like I need somebody physically there with me. I can't be doing it by myself. Well, that's true. Like I, I need somebody. I don't know. I think it was God saying, don't do this anymore. Maybe it was. Maybe all my Christian friends are right. <laughs> no, and that's I need not to what repent I'm saying. And give it to God. I don't know, but it was wild. So that it's is... been a while since I brought, and that's the one that everybody keeps asking for. Like, hey, when are you bringing back? Um, I'm not asking. Angela. You do you. <laughs> you just do whatever you need to do. That story reminds me of uh, the Corey Taylor episode of a very popular podcast called Mind Bailey's Breakdown. We had, if people haven't heard it, yeah, they should they check should it out. They should check it out. Thank you, Jonathan, for <laughs> mentioning a, 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 an episode of our show where we did. We had a very, it was very creepy. Before we just like move totally on from this, like, have you made any sense? Like, do you believe your grandmother was communicating to you? I personally believe that there is a very thin veil yeah, between absolutely. the realities that we consider um, reality with air quotes and non-reality and that these things merge all the time. Yeah. I don't know about, you know, ghosts throwing things across rooms. That has never happened. But I do believe in the um, potential for other entity communication. I fully believe in it. And I'm not fully convinced that it was my grandma, which is why... I haven't brought it back. If I was convinced that it was my grandma, then it would be like peaceful. And it'd be like, oh, cool. She came to visit me. Yeah, let's do another episode. No, no. Why mm -hmm. are we okay with people coming to visit this way? Can we talk Listen, about that? My Thea Mary just died and I've been asking her to come visit me and she has not. And I'm like, what's up, girl? It doesn't scare you? I mean, if it's like a nice, like if it's a butterfly that lands on my nose, I'll be like, oh my God, okay, Thea Mary. But and I'll assign it my Thea Mary. You know what I mean? But... I don't want my Google Chrome to go bloop, bloop in no. the middle of the night. No, no, like, no, I no. I don't want that kind of sign. <laughs> don't visit me that way, please. I should, I should another time bring Angela to my house. I mean. Is it haunted? You should. Well, this house has some specialness. Um, and my, my lovely publicist um, lived here for years after I moved out. My, my son was born in the living room. Oh. Like I like, lived here. And then I moved out and um, and I rented it. And um, she had a very nice time living here and they had their first child here. Aww. And when she moved out, she was um, she like kind of had a, a talk with me. And she's like, has anyone ever said stop? Yeah. And she was very specific that Ooh. something <laughs> near the fireplace. And, okay. you know, nothing specific has happened there. You know, like the cat ones went up there and we had to like get her down. Sure, sure, sure. Um, but there's there's been a lot of interesting things, I would say, in this house. And she's a person who's had other very, very special paranormal things mm -hmm, happen to her. Mm -hmm. So she's a person, I think, who's receptive to that. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of interest to um, this house. It, it talks. Like, it's not just like, oh, old houses are creaky. Like, like there's a pattern to the creaking. If mime, for example, is in a heightened emotional state, it seems to creak more than if she's not. It creeps me out. One of your skill sets and really a skill set attached to some of the things that people most know you for um, involve your incredible mimicry. 
and yeah. your ability also you you capture you have one of those voices you can capture just about every um inflection every accent like you i mean you can really i don't want to say you throw your voice because it's mm -hmm. not like a ventriloquist mm -hmm. kind of thing mm -hmm. but you you have a very special control you know of your voice and Thank of your you. vocal cords and um i i don't i don't feel the need to kind of go into tremendous detail because i don't want to, to make more of something. Sure, sure. But I think it's very interesting. You're a very thoughtful person. You're a very culturally sensitive person. Yeah. And I wonder if you can speak a little bit to what you see as kind of the role of comedy yeah. and what it means to you um, to, to bring people joy and to be an entertainer mm -hmm. when sometimes in, in today's climate, it can feel dangerous yeah, in many ways. Totally. And however you're comfortable speaking about it, I, I would love to hear from you because yeah. I just, I love what you do, how you do it. And so much of comedy does not hold up. Sure. And I, I have found that your comedy absolutely does, despite all of the cultural ups and downs yeah. and swings left and right. Um, I'm I'm kind of curious what where you've landed as a comedian. So, um one thing I want to comment on is the accent and my ear and ability to hear and say mm -hmm. is um I I love to sing, mm -hmm. right? Like I'll hear something and then I can like mimic mm -hmm. the sound. Like it's not exactly like I can't Mariah Carey like yep. get there, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But I can mimic pretty well. And one thing I cannot do is harmonize hmm. because I'm listening to you. So the second I hear you hit this note, don't ask me to hit that note. Right. I'm going to do what you're doing mm -hmm. because I mim I hear and I, I say what I hear. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so that's how I'm able to like do accents. If I'm in a conversation mm -hmm. with somebody, they have an accent, give me two sentences and I'm yeah. already like talking like you. Sorry. <laughs> um, as far as comedy goes, I feel my job as a comedian is to hold up a mirror to society and show you <laughs> what I see, but also it's just, here's a mirror. And so um, sometimes it looks like a stereotype. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it looks like a generalization, right? But a lot of times I'm the messenger holding up the mirror mm -hmm. and... My, my holding of the mirror is the words that I say on the mm -hmm. microphone. And then sometimes people can get upset mm -hmm. and they're like, I don't like that you just said that. And I'm like, oh, but it's just, it's the mirror. Mm -hmm. Like, sorry, this is what I'm, I'm just holding up a mirror is what I'm doing. Um, so I feel like the rules are definitely changing. The rules are changing. And evolving is great. We need to evolve as human species. But I think sometimes we overshoot it and it's like, here's the line and we needed to like evolve past this line. And then people are like jumping way over there. And I'm like, oh, wait, you're too far now. Like what? Hold on. Do you even know? Are you relatable now? Are you a human? Um, and it's kind of like our world, humanity is very messy and colorful and intricate and beautiful. And that's what makes us so beautiful is that we're colorful, intricate, and complicated. And I feel like where we're at now is we try to black and white everything. And it takes the beauty out of art, out of comedy, out of storytelling, because we have to be very black and white to make sure that we don't offend someone, that we include everyone, that all the things, all the things, all the things, which I think are great. I don't want to offend people. I want to include people. But at the same time, I still want to be accurate when I'm holding up this mirror. So let's not pretend that we don't see these things. So it's hard. It's a hard place to be. Unless that's for me, because there's a lot of comics out there. They're like, I don't care. I'll say whatever I want. And it's not hard for them because they just say what they want to say and they don't care. And that's great for them. I wish I had some more of that in me, but I care a little too much. I don't like offending people. Like the word disappointment is like my trigger word. Like if people are like disappointed in me, I'm like, <laughs> people are disappointed in me. Um, so I think I care too much. And so I, I, a lot of times, I definitely play it safer these days. Thank you so much for, um, you know, for speaking to that. Um, 
There's so many more things I would love to talk to you about, but for for the time being, um, Jonathan and I are so grateful that you spoke to us, and also to have you here in person is really special. Um, the book, Who Do I Think I Am? Stories of Cholo Wishes and Caviar Dreams. Um, it's Angela with a J. Yeah, before we go, before I need you we... to go to one of those pictures. You know which one I want you to go to. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Go ahead. You can set it this up is, as okay. I'm finding it. So growing up, I was a huge well, they can't see, but we'll insert a picture. Blossom fan. And I would wear my Blossom <laughs> hat every day. And people would call me Blossom. And we kind of look alike. Yeah. Also. And so I had to put my picture in there of me with my Blossom hat. And your hat, was it black? Yeah. Or it's just the, I didn't know if the colored no, picture. Yeah, and then there's, the you had a flower. red, a red flower. Um, <laughs> sorry, the pictures just kill me. These yeah. pictures. But that was like, so she talks about, she was my fan. I grew up like the biggest Blossom fan. Like I would get made fun of because I would wear that hat all the time. Like people would make fun of me and I'd be like, I'll fight you. Like, I don't even care. Um, <laughs> and Yeah. Just really a pleasure to watch your career and get to learn more about you. And I'm just wish so many only good things for you. And Thank it's you. like to see um, to see you like put into words so mm -hmm. much of your journey. It's incredibly, incredibly it's hilarious, but also really, really thoughtful. Thank you. Um, who do I think I am? Angela Johnson Reyes. And it's Angela with a J. If you have not seen Angela's specials, do yourself a favor. We need to laugh. We need to laugh now more than ever. Um, it is so, so good. It's Thank so you. smart. And it's just so much fun to have you here. From our breakdown to the one we hope you never have. We'll see you next time. It's Maya Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PA. HD or two. One, five.